If you're a Bitcoin noob, a beginner who has just started, you know, to go down the rabbit hole and, you know, I was thinking, maybe you're thinking, you know, to finally get yourself a mobile wallet, a wallet in general, uh, then you definitely want to watch this series, this special series with Econo Alchemist, who has published an amazing, fantastic five-part series on how to use uh, mobile wallets, would it be uh, Samurai Wallet, Blue Wallet, Sparrow, the desktop wallet, and uh, using you know non-KYC um, Bitcoin, buying non-KYC Bitcoin on ATMs or BISC network. So we're going to do this part by part. Uh, we didn't want to go you know too much into complexity, like you connecting it you know to your full node or to your whatever dojo. So the first part is about Samurai Wallet, the very basic stuff. Step by step, you know, Econ Alchemist uh, does a fantastic job explaining to you everything you need to know about, uh, you know, setting up your wallet, uh, coin mixing, coin joining, and it's really most of it is self-explanatory. So, without further ado, this is the first part with Econ Alchemist Part One for especially for Bitcoin noobs, the whole series. And um, yeah, have fun and let me know your questions and comments. And make sure you follow me and Economy Alchemist on Twitter and subscribe, please, on my YouTube channel and my podcast platform. So have fun and I'll see you soon. Hey, welcome back to the show. Econa Alchemist, burn the bridge, <laughs> cut the Thanks tie, burn the me. bridge. <laughs> it's good to be back. It's been a while. Yeah, it is. Been a lot, so much going on. Jeez. Um, so, Econa Alchemist, you. You did some amazing work. Um, you were you published it on your not only your website, but it was published on Bitcoin Magazine. It was a, a five-part series, like a super easy to follow tutorial guide, whatever you want to call it, uh, for Bitcoin beginners uh, on which wallets uh, again. So I did. Um, you know the the whole series. Part one of the series is the dangers of KYC and the importance of self-custody. And I wanted to kind of break that out and separate it into its own part so that people who don't understand those concepts realize how important it is. Um, because when I was first getting started, like nobody warned me about KYC. People were like, yeah, get on Coinbase. It's cool. Like, no, and it's not cool. And I don't want people thinking that they can just arbitrarily hand out their ID without any future consequences. So I thought that that was important to break that out because I didn't receive that message when I was first starting. And I want to make sure people who are getting started, Bitcoin beginners have a, a good fighting chance to make an informed decision about whether or not they want to use KYC. Um, and then, and then I explain at like a very high level, just how to go from zero to having a Bitcoin wallet secured on your mobile phone. So for the Android users, I did Samurai wallet for the iPhone users. I did blue wallet. And then for desktop users, I did Sparrow wallet. Mm -hmm. Um, I did mine on windows Sparrow wallet. You can also do on like Mac or Linux, but I just did windows um, and then the last part of the series, part five, was how to actually go out to an ATM, buy some non-KYC Bitcoin, just a small amount, and then use that to fund your first BISC transaction. And then I show you how to like set up your Bitcoin wallet on BISC, how to set up a, a national currency account, and then how to make your first trade on BISC, and then... You know, once you make that first trade, then you got a little bit more Bitcoin and you can fund more escrow requirements and, and keep building up more trades. So I really tried to put like a whole package together with this series to help people um, get started with Bitcoin. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love your empathetic approach. I mean, can I ask you, like, uh, because you you chose, you picked um, Sparrow um, versus Spectre. Is that like, do you think like Spectre is definitely not for beginners? Or, I mean, at least, you know, for, to create a single wallet, like. Honestly, you know, I don't really have an opinion of Spectre because I haven't, I have never used Spectre. Um, when I was 
you know, when we first started talking about putting a series together like this and I wanted to include desktop wallets. So as I was searching for documentation on desktop wallets, it, you know, I found Spectre and, uh, and I've also found Sparrow, you know, Electrum was out there, but I didn't really want to use Electrum. Um, Bitcoin Core, I could have done that, but I didn't want to do that. Um, so I really kind of just narrowed it down to Spectre or Sparrow. And then um, I, I had never used either of the wallets, to be honest with you. Um, but when it came to Spectre, it just seemed like there was a much larger following in the Telegram channel. And it seemed like there was a, a lot more, not a lot more, but there was, there was more documentation on Spectre already. Um, so I kind of wanted to take the path less traveled, um, and, you know, put some content together for a step-by-step -step guide, uh, for a wallet that, that turned out to be a really amazing wallet. Um, and that there wasn't already like pre-existing documentation for, you know? Yeah, and it's so, good with you know doing this this sort of um, you know tutorial like uh, via video because I mean I, I can only suggest and recommend to everyone to you know go to your website or Bitcoin Magazine or wherever or to your Twitter handle and and find the links and put a, put those in the show notes anyway. Um, but it I thought it would be wise you know to do this uh, like on um, like via presentation like you're gonna do this right now. So I can ask, you know, the stupid questions that any, you know, potential noob or average user like I used to be uh, would would ask. And yeah, totally. You know, OK, well, let's yeah. kick it off. Um, if you're ready, cool. I'll just mute myself. All right. Yeah. And, you know, this isn't meant to be a lecture. So like <laughs> this is this is going to be a lot better if if you jump in with questions like yeah. stop me anytime and, and jump in with questions. That'll make it a lot better. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. So basic agenda, you know, we'll do the introduction, why self-custody is important, why KYC is dangerous, Samurai Wallet, Blue Wallet, Sparrow Wallet, BISC, and the conclusion. And in total, this is like 90 slides. So if we've got to break this up into different podcast episodes, it's totally cool. You just let me know when we've got to stop. So, you know, first of all, I'm not paid or endorsed by any companies, products, or services that are mentioned in this PowerPoint. Um, don't trust anything that I'm saying. You can verify all of this stuff for yourself. I'm just some crazy long-haired dude on the internet talking about magic internet money. Like, please, <laughs> just do your own research. Um, when you have questions, ask for help. This guide is designed for absolute beginners. Um, start with small amounts of Bitcoin until these concepts make more sense and you're more comfortable working with these tools. Um, and some good resources for community help is uh, the Samurai Wallet um, Telegram channel, the Blue Wallet Telegram channel, and the Sparrow Wallet Telegram channel. I should have added the BISC Telegram channel in here too, but um, you, can, you can find that online. Yeah, maybe a fi maybe a final note on the on the support side. They, I mean, I, I I really have super experience with Samurai Wallet. They have a super team. I mean, they're very responsive, very fast in their feedback. You know, when it when you write an email, you know, to their support whatever at samuraiwallet.com. So I just wanted you know give a shout out to them. It's it's really great because um, let me just give you an example. My my girlfriend's uh, Samurai Wallet was originally connected to my Dojo. And after, you know, I had to format my drive and all that, you know, so everything works again on my node. Uh, so I, I could, you know, I was able to, to reconnect my wallet to Dojo again, but then, you know, she couldn't find her balance even, mm -hmm. even after defaulting, you know, to Samurai Wallet. So they immediately, you know, checked everything and reset everything. And now it's everything visible, all the balances, you know, in the main dashboard and in nice. the post mix. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, dude, they, they've got an awesome community. Like, They've been so good to me, like answering every question I've ever had. And it's just been very educational and I really appreciate them. Um, so yeah, like why is self-custody important? Um, this is, if you're reading the articles on my blog or on Bitcoin Magazine's website, this would be part one of the series. Um, 
third parties cannot be trusted. If you think about the catastrophic failures of the Quadriga, Qua, <laughs> excuse me, Quadriga Exchange, uh, Mount Gox or Exmo, you know, those users got completely wrecked. These exchanges don't have FDIC or SIPC insurance. So once your funds are gone, they are gone. And you really don't have any repercussions. If, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, the legal battle with Mt. Gox is still ongoing. Um, so yeah, like don't, don't trust a third party with your keys. They're not your keys, not your coins. You're going to get wrecked if you do. Um, also, you know, how can users publicly verify against rehypothecation? Take Coinbase, for example. You don't know for sure, 100%, that the Bitcoin they're telling you is in your wallet isn't also being reproduced into someone else's wallet. Like, they might only have 10 Bitcoins, but among their group of customers, they may believe that they have 100 Bitcoins. You just, you don't know. And, and unless you're holding the keys to your wallet, you cannot cryptographically prove ownership of that Bitcoin. So, you know, if you're, if you are a victim of some covert rehypothecation from an exchange and that exchange gets hacked or the owners just disappear and you're just left with an IOU, like, dude, you're, you're just so screwed. Don't put yourself in that situation. Uh, many exchanges and on-ramps require KYC. KYC is an invasive scare tactic that is used to control people. Do not put your KYC information out there. You cannot erase a KYC event. I don't care if you take your coins off the exchange and mix them. I don't care if you try to do an atomic swap into some altcoin and back to Bitcoin, nothing you do is going to erase the KYC event. So it's there forever. And that will haunt you for the rest of your life. I, I've done it myself. I'm speaking from experience. Yeah, it's a Just scary thought, to be honest with you. It's a very scary thought. The problem is, I think, the practi practical approach to this whole thing, because, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've started using BISC network too, but um, I'm sure you're going to, you know, talk about BISC, like what are the potential improvements that could be made on BISC, you know, um, and it, it's pretty easy. It's user-friendly. It's become much more user-friendly. And But like the offerings, like to buy Bitcoin, it's, you know, you either have to uh, you know, have like a men like they take a minimum order or you know pay a pretty hefty a premium price on that. So you know, I'll I'll just let you explain a little bit maybe later on. Yeah, you know, I think you know with Bisc one of the one of the biggest hurdles is liquidity. Um, but I guess everyone's situation is different, and for me personally. I just try to maintain a lower time preference. And, you know, instead of taking offers that are out there, I try to post offers on BISC and then just leave that computer running and just wait and wait for someone to come by and take my offer to buy. Um, so, yeah, you, you definitely have to be a little bit more um, like you have to do some pre-planning and, and think ahead a little bit when you're using BISC because it's, it's not like you can just open up an app on your phone and click buy and boom, you're done, you're moving, you're shaking and you're going. It's, you got to have a little bit more patience and, and planning with it. But that's, that's kind of what I like about it. So I don't know, everyone's different and people are going to do what they want to do. I just want to warn them that Dude, once you put your KYC information out there, you're not getting it back. Um, and then you've got the ATMs, of course. I mean, but you know, it's still with six, seven percent premium price usually. Um, but it's you know worth it if if you know if you can uh, if you can just uh, you know uh, 
forget about KYC and, uh, you know, all this crap um, that's going to haunt us uh, <laughs> one day. Uh, ATM, I think, is a good alternative. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. And that that's part um, that's part of my tutorial uh, in part five. I, I walk the, the readers through how to get a little bit of money off of an ATM or sorry, a little bit of Bitcoin from an ATM and then use that to fund their first BISC trade. Um, I, I like ATMs because of like the privacy element, but the, dude, the fucking premiums on ATMs drive me insane. It doesn't need to be that high. Uh, and that's coming from someone who like moved to Wyoming specifically to try and launch a Bitcoin ATM business. The premiums do not need to be that high. You can run a profitable business without screwing over users that bad. Um, so I, that's my two cents. Yeah, it's the premiums just drive me insane. But it's, you know, I would still rather pay that premium than give somebody my identification. Um, where was I? The, uh, you know, there, where's the accountability with these data honeypots if there is a breach? You know, you've got exchanges like um, Coinbase who are actively and vocally working with government agencies around the world. Those government agencies are going to supplement their operations with government contractors. So you're going to have your KYC data, your Bitcoin balance on Coinbase's servers, on the government agency servers, on the government contractors' servers, like, and God knows where else you're going to have it. Eventually, there is going to be a data breach. Someone's going to make a mistake. And millions of users with their photograph, their address, their name, their email, their phone number, and their Bitcoin balance, their Bitcoin addresses all lumped together is going to get cracked wide open and dumped on the market, just like we saw with the ledger data. Exactly. Breach. Yeah. Classical example. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's terrifying, super terrifying. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, there's documented cases of kidnappings and ransoms to get Bitcoin from people. And imagine a not so distant future where the demand for Bitcoin has driven the price up to half a million dollars. Like that kind of information that's going to be in these honeypots is going to be really valuable to people who want to go out there and take it from unsuspecting users. So the best way to guard your privacy is to not put your KYC information out there to begin with. All exchanges are required to comply with the uh, Bank Secrecy Act regulations. That's why they uh, implement their KYC AML policies. Um, many exchanges actively provide services to law enforcement like we talked about. KYC data allows enforcement of potential 6102 orders and or unrealized capital gains tax. So, you know, when I'm talking about honeypots of data being breached by hackers and dumped on the dark market for criminals to buy so they can go out and do kidnappings and ransoms. That's like one prong of a two prong threat that we're watching develop here. The other prong of this threat is your own government. So if they want to confiscate your Bitcoin, all they have to do is get that data from the exchanges and they can see how much Bitcoin you bought. And if you want to argue boating accident, like that's fucking bullshit, dude. Go tell a government auditor you were in a boating accident and you don't have the Bitcoin anymore and watch what happens. You think they're just going to say, oh, oh, OK, well, have a good day, citizen. We'll see you later. Like, no, dude, they're going to fucking grill you. There's no way that a boating accident is going to relieve you at best what's going to happen is they're going to say you bought on this date and you had a boating accident on this date so if we do the math that means you had a capital gain of a hundred thousand dollars so 
please pay us $25,000. Uh, we're going to fine you because you didn't report this boating accident. We had to exhaust extra resources to try and figure this all out. So, it, you know, now you owe us $30,000. Like, and that, that's like a best case scenario. You're still going to get your unrealized capital gains tax enforced on you, even if you want to tell them you had a boating accident. And I don't know, maybe, maybe that's a good strategy for you, but I, I don't think that's a smart. Um, and okay, let's say you take your coins off the exchange and you mix them and you, you want to say, well, they can't prove that I own these coins. Yeah, technically, but technically speaking, you cannot prove that you don't own those coins anymore. So how much is proof of ownership really going to be an issue when the government has proof of event to begin with? I just, I don't think boating accident is a reasonable excuse. I don't think mixing is going to get you off the hook. Mixing will give you forward-looking privacy so that when you spend your Bitcoin, nobody can look back and trace it back to the exchange, which is great. And I think you should coin join anyways, even if they are KYC funds. And spend but, right in, like directly from the post mix, like you know, like directly from the post mix uh, wallet, or you know, yeah. like in Samurai. Right, and if you're using Samurai, like your funds go into Whirlpool, and then from there you can use post mix spending tools to even further screw up those chain analysis heuristics. Um, and yeah, I think you absolutely should be using those tools, even if you're starting with KYC funds. I just want people to understand that mixing is not going to erase your KYC event, nor is it necessarily going to get you off the hook when the government comes knocking with the 6102 order. So just um, if you really want to undo the damage you've done to yourself with KYC, I think the best option is to sell the coins back to the exchange that you came in on because then you have undeniable proof that you no longer own those coins. Then you take that money and you go back into Bitcoin through a non-KYC. You know, there's, there's a lot of nuance and detail that can go into all that. but Yeah, especially tax, tax uh, related. Uh, yeah, it uh, could be an issue because in Austria and I think in Germany it's the same. If you keep your Bitcoin for a year, after one year, you don't pay any, you know, capital gains or whatever, speculation tax or whatever, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, that's in so Austria could, and Germany, yeah. You could sell it after a year and yeah. walk away, free yeah. and clear. Yeah. Might have to um, use Cut my off. European passport to... <laughs> sell my bitcoin yeah my dude, bitcoin. let's do it <laughs> <laughs> oh man is that like eu wide or just austria and germany no, i think it's specifically i'm not sure to be honest with you but i but it's definitely germany and austria is like that yeah whether the other eu countries can you know go confirm uh you know uh, not sure so um you know my next point is that KYC data cripples the permissionless benefits of Bitcoin and opens the door for censorship. Yeah. The more, the more people that are allowing these broken legacy system regulations to pollute the Bitcoin ecosystem, you know, the, the more likely it is that we're going to see some ridiculous development of whitelisted mining pools or, um, I mean, God, just look at PayPal, for example, like they don't even, you're not even holding actual Bitcoin. It's just an IOU. And it, you've got all these companies out there that are selling the idea of Bitcoin to people, but that's not what's being delivered in, ex in, ex in exchange for this shitty IOU that they were tricked into procuring. They're giving up all their personal information to do it. It's just... It's just propagate or um, perpetuating the the system that is broken, the system that has affected people. Speaking from personal experience, when we were trying to launch our Bitcoin ATM business, we were rejected by twelve banks in Wyoming. Um, 
two banks in California, one bank in New York, two banks in Colorado. It was like 17 banks all together. And because we had the word blockchain and cryptocurrency in our articles of incorporation, no bank would touch us with a 10 foot pole. Uh, and that's, that's censorship. You know, here we are trying to start a, legi- a legitimate business and we're being censored from interacting with the legacy financial system, which really cripples a small company that's trying to start up and interact with the world economically. So, and now you're in Wyoming with your, did you find, I mean, this is like, you know, they're so super innovative now in, in, in Wyoming. Well, that, so we moved to Wyoming in um, May of 2019. Yeah, May of 2019, we moved up to Wyoming after listening to Caitlin Long, Jared Olson, and Tyler Lindholm uh, give a speech at a conference. Uh, and they were talking about all the innovative cryptocurrency laws that they were doing up there. And our mistake was not consulting an attorney to see how those laws would benefit us. We just kind of took their word for it and like sold our house, jumped ship, went up to Wyoming, went for it, dove right in. And, uh, and then, you know, come to find out those, the laws that they're passing are great for institutions. And if you have like $25 million capital to put up as a bond to be, um, to get your banking charter. Great. I'm not that guy. I can't do that. I'm not cracking. I'm not Avanti. I can't. So the laws that they passed are like, they're way up here and I'm like way down here. You know, there's, there's the, the laws just really didn't have any benefit for a small micro startup trying to do something in the space. But you know, it's, where we moved in Wyoming wasn't far from our hometown in Colorado. So after a year of being in Wyoming, we sold the house up there and then moved back to where we were originally. That's where I'm at. Um, Users can mitigate all the issues listed above and more by taking the radical responsibility of self-custody over their non-KYC Bitcoin. And then the next step is to start running your own Bitcoin full node and just build your understanding of Bitcoin. Any questions on KYC before we move on to Samurai Wallet? No, that was pretty comprehensive. But, you know, as we go along, maybe, um, you know, those uh, KYC questions kind of arise anyway. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's jump into Samurai Wallet. Um, So Samurai Wallet is available on Android. If you're an Android user, I highly recommend checking out Samurai Wallet. You can download Samurai Wallet from their website. Uh, You can download it from the Google Play Store. Um, You can get it from F-Droid, or if you're good with uh, code, you can compile it from source from their GitLab. Uh, So there's a lot of different ways to get the Samurai Wallet. The way that I covered in the step-by-step guide was just the Google Play Store. And I did that because I thought that would be like the lowest barrier to entry for the most people. And, um, you know, mate, um, maybe a word of caution. I think there are some fake ones or uh, what do they have? What do people on Play Store have to look for? Does it say early access like you're you're showing here? Yeah. So this is what you should see. And you want to make sure you're seeing 100,000 plus downloads because there's there's no scam application, malicious malicious application that's trying to um, imitate Samurai Wallet that's gonna have 100,000 down. (laughs) I hope to to God it doesn't. But um, yeah, so it'll say early access. It'll have 100,000 plus downloads. Uh, And this is what it should look like from your Android phone. And all you're gonna do is click on install And after the install is finished, then you're going to click on open. After the app opens up, it's going to ask you if it can have permission to access your camera. And the application is going to need access to your camera so that you can scan QR codes. And then the operating system is going to ask you if it's okay for that application to access your camera. So you're going to give the app permission and you're going to give the OS. And then the next thing it's going to ask you is if 
the app can have permission to read and write files on your phone. And the reason it needs that is because there's an encrypted backup file for your wallet that it puts on your phone and that's password protected. And then the operating system is going to ask you if that's okay too. So approve it for the app, approve it for the OS. And then you should be looking at this screen. And the first thing you're going to want to do is enable Tor by activating that slider. And it's going to take a few minutes to connect to Tor. But once it does, it should have a little check mark and say Tor connected. And then you're going to click on start new wallet. If you have an existing dojo, this is the step where you would connect that dojo. You would, before clicking on start new wallet, you would click on this three dot menu and then you'll see an option show up for connect to existing dojo. You would click on that and then you'd be able to scan the QR code from your dojo and it would link it to this application. Now this is important because if you're not running your own Bitcoin node, then you're trusting someone else's node. So that is an advanced topic, setting up your own node. So I, it goes outside the scope of my tutorials here. But if you look at my article online, there's a ton of great resources. Uh, Bitcoin Q&A has one on his uh, Bitcoiner.guide website, uh, specifically for nodes. So I definitely recommend checking that out if you want to run your own node. Yeah, and maybe uh, uh, something to um, to think about is that once you, I think, establish or, or set up a Samurai wallet with the default server of Samurai, like a third-party server, and then you decide you know, to have your own full node and whatever that is, my node or whatever, your Dojo or Ronin or whatever that is, and then connect to Dojo, uh, uh, I think it was advised once to start a new wallet, right? I mean, uh, to to right to to recreate a new wallet, not not and not to work with the old wallet and then connect the old wallet, which was on on the default server, to the dojo. Is that something you want to comment on? Like, I think I think that's a good best practice. You know, it, if you're adversarially thinking about it, then. What you've done by connecting your Samurai wallet to their node is that you've exposed your X pubs. And that's the same for any like HD Bitcoin wallet that that's blue wallet. That's the vast majority of all wallet applications you put on your phone. It's going to connect to the application developers Bitcoin node and it needs to do that so that it can show you your Bitcoin balance and so that it can generate your um, receiving addresses. Um, it needs to have that information so that it can constantly be, be monitoring the transactions in and out and show you your current balances. That's just how it works. So if you um, set up a wallet and you just do like a stock setup like this, a default setup, and it connects to Samurai wallet servers and some time goes by, you get more into Bitcoin, you set up your own dojo and, and you wanna connect your Samurai wallet to your own dojo. If you connect the same wallet to your own dojo, that's great. However, you're still using information that you have given to somebody else. So it's probably a best practice to set up a new fresh wallet and then use that wallet to connect to your dojo. That way you can ensure that no one has the XPUB information to the wallet that you're going to be using. Yeah, and I think um, the unfortunate thing is that <laughs> um, if you like, if you you know set up your own wallet, you know your wallet with a with the default server, and you create the pain, which I'm sure you're going to talk about later on. You know the Paynim address. If you create a new wallet, you you would create also you would have to create a new Paynim address, right? So you can't keep your old mm -hmm. one, right? Yeah. Well, yes and no. So it's true that every Paynim is unique to each wallet. If I understand what I've heard the developers talking about correctly, I do believe that in the near future, 
users will be able to customize the icon, the avatar, and the name of their pay names. So like this, you could potentially um, take the name of your old pay name and the avatar and save it as the name and avatar for your new pay name. I think, and I hope I didn't like totally screw that up. If any of the developers are listening to me talk about this right now and I screwed it up, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think you will be able to customize your pay. But to your point, yeah, you're going to get a different pay name every time you start a new wallet. Um, in my tutorial, like I said, I uh, move forward without connecting to Dojo. So you just click on start new wallet. And then the next thing the wallet's going to ask you is to create a passphrase. Your, this passphrase is going to be your FIP39 13th word. And it's also going to be the password that encrypts your wallet backup data file on your phone. So it's both with Samurai Wallet. Any combination of numbers, letters, or special characters will work. I recommend using high entropy passwords that can't be guessed, like from a random password generator. Um, other people recommend to like use one that you can remember that's easy for you to remember um every user's got to weigh their trade-offs and make that decision for themselves uh after you've created your pa your password and your your passphrase uh then you re-enter it and then you have to click on this box to acknowledge that you understand in the event that something goes wrong and you lose access to that passphrase, nobody can help you recover that passphrase. And this goes, this ties back into that concept of radical responsibility. You know, when you're trusting a bank or you're trusting a third party, you're really putting yourself at risk. And when you want to mitigate those risks by taking on self custody, you are taking on the radical responsibility of your bitcoin there's and no this is a totally new mindset i think a total new shift in, in you know in thinking and, and in mind in your mindset a total self-responsibility this is what self-sovereignty means you know i mean you we are responsible then you know for our own actions and for our own stupidity or or ignorance or whatever or forgetfulness <laughs> exactly yeah if you if you share your mnemonic seed phrase with somebody and they steal your Bitcoin, that is 100% your fault. Even if you are the victim of a phishing scam and you punch those 12 words into the computer because you think you're updating your software, I'm sorry. And I'm not saying this to be an asshole. It's just the reality of it. That is 100% your fault and 100% your problem. And that's what radical responsibility means. You gotta be responsible for yourself. You gotta be responsible for your actions. Take the time to really understand the implications of this stuff and take it seriously. Secure that passphrase somehow, stamp it into metal. Secure your seed phrases somehow, stamp them into metal. Don't, the very... don't tattoo it, don't tattoo it into your skin. <laughs> Yeah, don't tattoo it. Um, but at the very least, you know, write it down on a piece of paper, put that in a safe or somewhere in a safe place like you would secure gold or jewelry. So you got to take that stuff seriously. There's no hotline to call if you have a problem in Bitcoin. There's no like card lock security feature in Bitcoin. You're on your own, man. So do yourself a favor and take the time to understand what you're working with and take it seriously. Um, so yeah, after you confirm that you understand no one's going to bail you out if you lose that passphrase, then click on next. And then it's going to ask you to put in a pin code. Again, I suggest using a complicated pin code that can't be guessed instead of just like hitting zero five times. Um, but you, you can put in a passphrase, uh, a pin code that's between five and eight digits. Um, this is a pin code that's going to like protect your Samurai wallet in the event that someone gains access to your phone and they try to open your wallet. Uh, they'll first be greeted with this um, access 
pin code. And if they don't know what your pin code is, or if they can't get it, then they're not going to get into your wallet. And if they do have access to your phone and they find the um, wallet backup data file, it's going to be encrypted with the passphrase you set on the previous screen. So then confirm the pin code and then uh, next will illuminate. And then the wallet is going to present you with your 12 words. And so this is what I was talking about, the mnemonic seed phrase. Like this is a human readable format of a very long and complicated number. So that long and complicated number is what unlocks your Bitcoin funds. And if anyone gains access to these 12 words and your passphrase, they will be able to take your Bitcoin funds. So when I said the, um, the passphrase was like your 13th word, this is what I meant. It, you've got these 12 words and then the passphrase is an added layer of protection needed to access your wallet. So this is why I recommend using a high entropy passphrase because in the event that someone finds your 12 words, then the only thing left protecting your Bitcoin is that passphrase. And if you use some weak passphrase and they're running like um, a password recovery tool on it, then it's likely that they're going to be able to crack it. So that's why I recommend using high entropy passwords that are um, resistant to those kinds of password recovery tools. Um, you, you want to secure, you want to write these words down at least write them down on a piece of paper. The reason you want to do that is because you, you don't want to type these into a computer. You don't want them in digital format. You don't want to take a screenshot of these words. Um, you don't want to share these words with anyone for any reason. Uh, your Bitcoin is only as secure as these 12 words and your passphrase. Don't say these words out loud. You never know what devices in your home are listening to you. So don't say them out loud. What else should I say about this? Don't photograph. <laughs> maybe, yeah, you already, you said don't screenshot, but maybe don't photograph or make whatever pictures with other with another camera yeah. or whatever. Yeah, because as soon as these 12 words are in a digital format, then they can be moved, copied, transferred, transmitted, uh, very easily and and you can find yourself in a sticky situation very fast so once you've secured these words double check your work take your time make sure everything's written down legibly uh, and then confirm acknowledgement that you've secured the 12 words and then click on return to wallet and then you're gonna be greeted by your new pay now so samurai wallet has implemented, they're the only wallet so far that's implemented Bit47. And this Paynim was born from that. This Paynim allows you to post a payment code publicly that, that protects the privacy of the rest of your wallet. So yeah, like- It's an amazing feature, I think, you know, because it, right, it creates every time a new address. Isn't that right? Yeah, so what it really is an underrated feature, and I, I really do wish more wallets would implement it. So basically what it does is when two paynims connect, um, if I understand this correctly, when, when two paynims connect, they start to generate addresses based on that are derived from pieces of information from both parties. And so those derived addresses are unique to those two wallets. Um, which means that like any transactions between those two are not going to expose information about transactions in either of the other wallets. So if you have like a payment code posted online as, as like a donation page link or something, um, no one's gonna be able to, to to, um, to, to figure out any more information about your wallet, your balances, your previous transactions from that payment code. Whereas if you just post like a Bitcoin address on a donation page, then 
people can copy and paste that address into a block explorer and they can see how much Bitcoin has been sent to it, how much Bitcoin has been spent from it, where the Bitcoin went from, where the Bitcoin came from, um, sorry, went to where it came from. Um, so the Paynim, the payment code with the Paynim um, just really helps you preserve your privacy. So you can still just put a static QR code out there and not have to worry about people being able to monitor where your Bitcoin is coming from and where it's going to. Yeah, unfortunately, as you said, as you mentioned already, more wallets should do that. But until now, only like a samurai, like a samurai user with a, another samurai user, right, can can do a Paynim transaction, right? So it's not compatible with other. Yeah, like there's no Paynim like on, on yeah. other wallets. Yeah, that's. That's the current situation. Um, I, I think Sparrow Wallet has shown some interest in implementing BIP47. So that'd be really cool to see that happen this year. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, once you are seeing your pay name, then you want to go ahead and claim your pay name. And uh, Samurai Wallet has a website called paynim.is and your when you claim your pay name, it's going to be on there for other Samurai Wallet users to find or anyone who wants to look at pay names. It'll be in that directory. Um, pay names can be used to display public payment codes. Yeah, we talked about that. All right. Once you've claimed your pay name, then you should be looking at your wallet home screen. This is what the home screen will look like. If you click on this icon right here, it'll take you to your Whirlpool wallet. Um, if you click on this icon right here, you can reset your uh, Tor connection. Uh, you can reset your Dojo connection. This will launch your camera. This is a menu where you have some more options, settings. Uh, this will display your Bitcoin balance. And then if you click on this blue plus sign on the bottom, it's going to bring up uh, generate a receiving address. You can click on the piggy bank. If you want to send Bitcoin, you can click on that icon. The purple icon will bring you to your pay name and the blue icon will open up a whirlpool. So you, at this point, you're ready to start receiving Bitcoin. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. You can, you know, from the last screen, you can just click on receive and click on the green piggy bank. And that'll bring up a screen that looks like this and you'll be looking at a QR code. You can click on advanced if you want to use like different address types. So Samurai Wallet will support the, um, the legacy addresses that start with one, the, um, the um, help me out here, the uh, nested SegWit addresses nested, yeah. that start with three, and, segwit, and yeah. then the uh, the native SegWit addresses are the ones that start with BC1. The BC1 addresses, I recommend using those because they function in a way that uses less data, which is gonna help you save on mining fees when you're doing transactions. Um, so once you have this QR code, you can like physically display it to somebody and they can scan it with their wallet and send you Bitcoin. That can come to Samurai Wallet. So any, any other wallet can just scan your QR code and send you Bitcoin. Um, or you can just copy and paste the address if you want to like send it to somebody in a secure email or on an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app or however you want to relay that information to somebody, you could do that. Um, Going back, if you click on the, the Paynim icon, then you can pull up your payment code. And if you are interacting with another Samurai Wallet user, then using your Paynim, they can scan this payment code and they can follow you with their Paynim. You can follow them with your Paynim. And then you guys can start working.
working on collaborative cahoots transactions together, which is we'll get into that a little bit. That right now is unique to Samurai Wallet users. As the regular QR code for the BC1, that's not unique. So I did an example where I collaborated with another Samurai Wallet user to... Are you back? Yeah, sorry. I had some bandwidth issues. That's why I, I tried to turn off the video, but somehow, uh, yeah. But yeah, we can just continue. Can you, can you uh, just go back to that uh, um, part where you said when you connect to, your, to another peer or something like that, to another... Uh, yeah. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? You're breaking. Oh, shit. Okay. I can hear you now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is it clear? Am I? Yeah. Broken? Now you're, you're okay, coming me, through clear now. Yeah. Let me, let me turn off my video. Is it better now? Can you hear me? It seems pretty stable now. Okay. Okay. Can you go to that part yeah. where you, where you started off uh, saying when you connect to another peer via Paynium or something like that? On this slide? Yeah, I think so. It was just like a minute ago or so. Oh, like when I was talking about building the transaction? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I wanted to demonstrate how to, um, like, receive Bitcoin. So I did an example where I used another Samurai wallet, and I collaborated with another Samurai wallet user to send some Bitcoin into this address. And so... Um, we built a collaborative transaction together that took inputs from the other Samurai Wallet user and it took inputs from me and it mixed everything together and the transaction had four total outputs. Two of those outputs were identical. One of the identical outputs was the actual spend and the other identical output was a decoy. And then the other two outputs were the change returning to both of us. So um, building transactions in that way is going to disrupt chain analysis heuristics and help users maintain their... Um, so this is the, the transaction uh, being received by the Samurai Wallet in our example. And this is the painting wallet. So I used this wallet to collaborate with a payment from this list. And together we deposited funds to my example wallet. Once you receive funds in your wallet, you can click on that transaction and start looking at some more details about it. So in the app, it'll tell you the date, how many confirmations it has, the mining fee, um, the mining fee rate. Did I lose you again? No, no, no. I just turned off your video just, just in case for bandwidth issues. And I turned off mine too. So, so we have only the presentation. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so then you can also look at the transaction ID. And then you can click on this icon right here. And it'll pull up that transaction ID on OXT. And then you can see even more information that's like the block explorer and so this is how that transaction looks on kycp.org um, so you can see that there were eight inputs and four outputs and you can see that two of those outputs were identical so one was the actual spend to our example wallet and the other one was a decoy which was actually return to the collaborator that worked with me to build this. Can you explain decoy? What, what does a decoy mean? Um, so, yeah. So what we mean is that if an outside observer is looking at this transaction, they're going to see that it has two identical outputs. And, you know, if, if I were looking at this with no prior knowledge, I would think that the larger amounts are the payments and the smaller amounts are the change. Um, so what's interesting is that, you know, it, it, would, it would appear that there was a large payment of 0 0.04,
but it's confusing because you have two identical outputs. Um, and, and so this, this introduces reasonable doubt into chain analysis. So now I can't really say for certain what's going on here or who, which of these inputs are now connected to which of these outputs. Or in other words, like I, I can't say for certain if the, the owners of any of the outputs are related to the owners of any of these inputs. I would, it would be safe to assume that some of this is change returning to the original owner, but it's, it's now confused. And I can't say with any kind of certainty which of these outputs are linked to any of these inputs. So if I were chain analysis and I knew who one of the owners was, on this side of the transaction, on the input side of the transaction, and I try to follow the funds going out of that transaction, I'm not gonna be able to declare with any kind of certainty that, that these belong to the person that I was trying to follow through the block. Because you know, when I say decoy, what I mean is that one of these is the actual spend going to the the intended receiver and the other one is is going back to one of the two collaborators who worked on the transaction so gotcha by okay. having a an actual spend and a decoy spend then it, it creates that reasonable doubt where you don't know which one was the actual spend and which one was a decoy or if they were both spends or if they were change outputs, you, you just, it just creates a lot of uncertainty. And that's how we disrupt those chain analysis heuristics, those common ownership input heuristics. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And, uh, and like breaking these links and, you know, breaking this uh, ownership heuristics, whatever it's called, like, um, it can be increased by by post mixing, right? By additional post mixing, is that like the whole purpose? Yeah. So this this um, this transaction we built, it's called a Stonewall X two transaction, and it's a post mix spending tool that's available in Samurai Wallet. So the idea is that the fund, the inputs being used, should be coming from you know, in an ideal situation, you'd be spending from your coin joined Whirlpool output wallet. And your post mix UTXOs can be used with a um, post mix spending tool that's going to collaborate with other Samurai wallet users to confuse the heuristics on the blockchain even more than they already are after being world. There's a number of post-mix spending tools available from Samurai Wallet. Um, there's Stowaway, which obfuscates the amount that's actually being transacted. So when you look at the transaction on chain, you, an outside observer cannot tell exactly how much was being spent because that's not the actual amount that was being received by the receiver. Um, there's Ricochet, which will put multiple hops in between your initial send and your final destination. So it'll just like, it'll move the funds in multiple transactions over a length of um, and then there's, you know, Stonewall X2, which is where you're collaborating with another user to try and build a transaction that's going to have two equal outputs. It always has four outputs, but two of them are going to be equal. One spend. Okay, and in a normal transaction, so, like, yeah, what, what a, I'm sorry, the Samurai Wallet does like a sort of a, by default, or like, like it, it, it generates sort of a, trans, or it creates a transaction uh, with ricochet or stowaway like by default like when when you don't like opt like you, when you don't select anything w w what does samurai do i i i believe the samurai wallet will always try it'll always make an attempt default to a stonewall transaction which is going to try and use 
multiple inputs from your wallet to try and build the transaction in in a way where it's going to have similar to what we're looking at here with four outputs two of them being equal but i if i understand it correctly the the stone wall is just being built from your wallet from a single user where the stone wall x2 is being built with two collaborators however both Stonewall and Stonewall X2 look identical in that there's always four outputs with two of the outputs being exactly the same. So when, you, when, when someone in chain analysis is looking at a transaction like this, for example, now not only is it confusing for all the reasons we covered, but there's additional uncertainty added because now they can't tell whether this was built by a single wallet, a single user, or if it was built by two users collaborating together. Oh, great. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, I think it should be clear. Yeah. And so, and so Samurai Wallet will, will attempt to make a Stonewall spend by default if you don't select like anything. Um, but if it can't build the Stonewall transaction because you don't have enough inputs or you know whatever the mechanics behind it are, if, if it just can't do it, then, then it'll just be like a normal. And if you want, you can just send like normal transactions in and out of Samurai Wallet. You don't have to use these tools, but they're available. So use them. Uh, do the cost change? I mean, maybe, maybe the users might be interested in like, uh, you know, uh, other differences like mining fees or, you know, transactional fees. Like, well, yeah. So every, every, um, Bitcoin transaction is going to take a certain amount of data. And based on that data size of that transaction, uh, your fee is going to be a little bit higher. So yeah, it's something to consider, but I don't think it's prohibitive in any way. I try to, I try to make every spend a coin join. I really do. Yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anything else on this while we're here? No, I think it's clear um, so far. I mean, um, I don't have any questions, but I'm sure, you know, there, <laughs> there'll be more questions coming uh, later on, maybe. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then from there, I wanted to demonstrate to users how to spend Bitcoin with Samurai Wallet. So, you know, the last example we were looking at was receiving 0 0.015 Bitcoin. Um, so from your home screen, you can click on the blue plus sign and then you can click on the red send icon and then you, it'll bring you over to this screen. And then from here, you can enable cahoots by toggling that slider. And once cahoots is enabled, then you're gonna have the option to build a Stonewall X2 or a stowaway. And like I was talking about, stowaway is gonna obfuscate the amount being spent and Stonewall X2 is going, to, is going to have four outputs with two of them being equal. Um, so in this example, I selected a Stonewall X2. And then for the participant, it, so it, it, you have to choose whether you're gonna do this in person with somebody or online. Um, doing it in person, you're gonna swap several QR codes back and forth with each other to so that the wallets can get all the information they need to build the transaction. When you do it online, um, it, it takes the uh, QR code swapping piece out of it and it's done encrypted over Tor uh, between both of the wallets. And it's, uh, it happens very fast uh, and it's a very smooth process. Um, for anyone who is using Samurai Wallet and doing these collaborative transactions manually, uh, watching them develop this Soroban uh, online Cahoots participation was just uh, an incredible um, process to watch develop. Um, it really was a user experience improvement. Um, 
Definitely um, a great development. Mate, can you explain the, again the difference between um, what is obfuscate? Like in stowaway, I get it. Okay, the, the, the amount is obfuscate, is hidden um, or, or not, you know, uh, it's you, you can't trace it back like to what amount. But what about Stonewall X2? What, like, um, what's the difference here? What, the, or the features, benefits? So with, so with, uh, with the Stonewall X2, so the Stonewall X2 is going to be like the one we were looking at here, where you've got you every Stonewall transaction, Stonewall X2, is going to have four outputs. And two of the outputs are always going to be exact ones, the decoy, and you, don't, you can't tell which is which. But with the, with the stowaway transaction, um, it's, it's also going to have multiple inputs and it's also going to have multiple outputs, but none of the information that's showing up on chain will allow an external observer to determine the amount that was actually spent in that transaction. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And then, um, so yeah, so in this example, I, I picked Stonewall X2 and then I selected online for the participant. And when you do that, it's going to pull up. Uh, your PayNim contact list. So this is the PayNim that that I had on my contact list. And so I'm going to connect to that PayNim. And together, we're going to build a transaction. And we're going to send the transaction, the Bitcoin to this blue wallet user here. So we're, we're two parties working together to spend to a third party with the Stonewall X2. Um, so make sure you and your collaborator have followed each other. You can do that by going to the purple PayNim icon and then like copy pasting your collaborator's payment code or scanning their QR code. And then they'll follow you and then you guys will be on each other's contact lists and you can collaborate on transactions. Um, and then when you see the list, just simply select that collaborator. And then in this example, we're going to send the Bitcoin over to this blue wallet user. And so you can see I, I've just scanned blue wallet with my samurai wallets camera. And now their address is here. This is the Bitcoin address we're going to send to. This is the amount I'm going to send them 1 million sats. We're doing a cahoots transaction. And I'm ready to review everything. So when I click on review, I'll get one last chance to double check the address and make sure it's correct. Double yeah. check the amount. And maybe the transaction priority, the, the the finding, the mining fees that you can select, uh, you know, low, middle, or high, uh, that should be done like after like checking mempool. Is that like a good advice for people? Like, you know, what is realistic yeah. to go through or? Yeah, mempool.space is an awesome resource. Um, and yeah, I, I do check mempool uh, to, to kind of see what's going on and see how expensive the transaction is going to be and, and what my priority should be. So like the lower you set this miner's fee, the longer it's going to take for your transaction to get confirmed. The higher you set that transaction fee, then the more incentive there is for miners to try and include your transaction in the next block. So, you know, you can use mempool.space to kind of determine, well, you know, transactions are, are averaging around a hundred sats per V byte right now. And I don't really see this coming down anytime soon. Can I really wait three days for this to go through or do I want to pay more? So you can kind of use mempool.space as a, as a tool to help you decide um, how to prioritize your transactions. Yeah, and, and the, the field, uh, what do you call it, the, the uh, ricochet is, is turned off by default. So you, you can, if you want to, like turn it on. Mm. Oh, yeah. So ricochet is going to, um, you know, Actually, to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever done, uh, I've, I've never tried to do a ricochet while I was doing a cahoots. Um, I'm not sure if those are mutually exclusive to each other or if you can do a cahoots ricochet. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I see. 
but even if it was possible, it would it would incur like more costs. Like like it would definitely be a little bit more expensive. Like have- yeah. So with with ricochets, I think you you pay all the mining fees up front. Um, have you have you done a ricochet cahoots combo? Uh, no, no, actually, no. I've never done cahoots. Actually, <laughs> it would be interesting to find out if if you can do them together. I don't know if you can or not. Yeah, maybe we can do that together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in this example, I have Cahoots toggled off and, or sorry, I have Ricochet toggled off and I have Cahoots toggled on. Um, so yeah, you can, you know, review everything. And, and once you're ready, you can just hit begin stowaway. And once you do that, you'll see a progress bar up top. And what's happening is your wallet is sending some information to your collaborator your collaborators taking that and adding to it and sending it back to you. And then you're adding to that and sending it back to them. And they're adding to that and sending it back to you one last time for, uh, to finalize everything. Uh, and this, this all happens with the Soro band development. This all happens in like less than seven seconds. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah. G- Super fast. G- yeah, and, and geographic distances don't matter. Like you're you're in what Central Europe? I'm in the United States. Like it would still take like seven seconds. Doesn't matter how far apart we are. I did one with somebody in the Philippines recently, and it was like no delay. It, it just it's incredible. It every time I see a cahoots transaction built over Soroban, it just blows my freaking mind. It's pretty awesome. If you haven't experienced it to any of your listeners, I highly recommend. And uh, so once the Cahoots transaction has all been built, then you have like one final summary to look at. And it's going to give you like an entropy estimate here. So you can see roughly uh, what kind of entropy is going to be in your transaction Um, and the total miners fee and the total amount being sent. And then once you're ready, just hit send and Samurai Wallet will ask you if you're sure you wanna broadcast the transaction and then hit yes, broadcast and it'll get sent off to the Bitcoin network. And then, you know, we sent this one to a Blue Wallet user. So this is just showing that the Blue Wallet user is now receiving the .01 Bitcoin. Are you still there? Yeah, sure. I'm here. Okay, just mm-hmm. just making sure. Is there anything like you would advise people, users, samurai users, not to do? Like whatever, like I'm just an example. Like look, don't look up your transaction on whatever. I don't know what is it, Blockstream or or any other site. Like any any advice what uh, not to do? Definitely. Well, you know any yeah. So the the potential problem with looking at your transaction IDs like unencrypted over Tor or um, without using Tor is that it's going to be possible for your IP address to potentially be linked to that transaction ID. So like, let's say you do a transaction and you want to look at it in a block explorer. So you copy the transaction ID and you go to Blockstream Explorer and look it up over ClearNet. Well, potentially somebody out there knows that your IP address is trying to find information about that transaction ID. And since Bitcoin's a public ledger, uh, that adversary could also look up that transaction ID and see the Bitcoin going into it, the Bitcoin going out of it, and follow all the links through the history of the Bitcoin that went into that transaction. And they could monitor the Bitcoin coming from that transaction for further future activity. And if they have your IP address, then, um, you know, they're going to know your general geographic location or you know, depending on who this adversary is, they may be able to do more advanced um, surveillance on you. Yeah, it's a good advice. So, yeah, it's really precious advice. I think we, should, we, yeah, we can give to people like you know to mitigate those risks as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. 
if you if you want to look at your transaction IDs, I, I recommend always, always, always doing that over tour at the very least. And you know, if you have a Ronin Dojo, you can actually um, use your Dojo as your block explorer and and do that totally privately. Um, yeah, so well, if you have like a my node, I mean, I have still my node, and you know, I can go into mempool and everything via my node, uh, my full node, and uh, you know, look up any transaction uh, discreetly as possible. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. You just, you know, when you're using ClearNet, you never know who's out there, who's listening, who's monitoring. You just don't you don't want to expose that information. You know, why, why volunteer any information if you don't? So that was a procedure like without, uh, you know, connecting your Samurai wallet to Dojo, you know, to your, to your own server uh, um, or, or via your own full node. So we can do that separately. Are you, um, are we finished with that part, uh, Mate? Yeah, so this is the, I believe that's the last slide of Samurai Wallet. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. going to go into Blue Wallet. Yeah, I there. think that's a good good timing, you know, to uh, make a full circle. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure I don't want to take up also too much time of yours today and uh, need to go back to my baby, <laughs> take care of her. Yeah, sure. Um, but that's, it's good. It's good we can, you know, maybe split it up and um, and do this like, you know, one part after another and thoroughly. Totally. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I, I guess one other thing I would advise Samurai Wallet users not to do is um, be careful about combining all of your mixed outputs or too many of your mixed outputs. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you combine all of your mixed outputs, then you can potentially like undo the privacy and anonymity you gained by going through Whirlpool in the first place. So. Just be right. careful about trying to spend it all at once. That was that was excellent, man. Um, yeah, loved it. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or anything we, we might have missed or any question I should have asked, um, which I can't think of right now? But um, no, I think you know I think we covered a lot, and I hope that anyone who is interested in using Samurai Wallet on Android um, has a good head start after listening to this awesome man so yeah let's uh you know uh, schedule maybe for next week and we'll do this one part after another so next next part should be the blue wallet and yeah and then the one after uh sparrow yeah yeah uh -huh. and then and then the very last part is uh buying out an atm and using that to fund your first bisque trade amazing super that's going to be yeah. fun Okay, man. Uh, thanks so much for your time and for sharing, you know, all your knowledge. I'm going to put all, you know, I'm going to put all your links in the show notes. Any other, you know, where people can follow you, any, your website, maybe um, economalchemist.com. Yeah. yeah. Check out economalchemist.com for my blog. Um, I've, you know, everything I do is kind of put there as my hub. Uh, and then I'm also pretty active on Twitter, Telegram, uh, Matrix. Um, you can find me out there. I, I use the Econo Alchemist handle everywhere. So <laughs> great. So yeah, <laughs> man, appreciate your help. And you know, and this is going to be a great tutorial for you know for noobs. This is was was you know as intended as original. You know, for noobs, uh, fresh beginners. And I right. think people are really overwhelmed. I think this 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 is going to help them enormously. Yeah, great, cool, awesome. Okay, man. Have a nice weekend. Have a wonderful you weekend. Too. And I'll see you soon. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye, mate. Bye, bro. Right. Thanks. Bye. See you. Okay, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it was Zikana Alchemist, also called Burn the Bridge. You can find him on Twitter. Follow him. Read his articles. His amazing articles. And uh, it's also published on Bitcoin Magazine on economyalchemist.com. Follow him on Twitter. And yeah, if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for uh, you know future uh, tutorials, guides, or the parts we're gonna continue, just let me know. Uh, follow me, please, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast platforms. Uh, and if you've loved any 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 of these episodes, leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. And my website is kvandavani.com. 
and um, the host of the Kevin Navani Connection Show. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.